uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. You know, we welcome you, Errol, and uh, thank you in advance for sharing your knowledge and insight in this event. Um, I also would like to uh, welcome you again, all participants. Uh, thank you for your participation in this webinar. Um, I hope this webinar series can be a good source of valuable knowledge of geosynthetics from geotechnical experts for you all. Now, I also thank all the committee members who has set up this webinar. Um, so um, please enjoy, enjoy the webinar. Stay safe and thank you. Okay, thank you, Bapak David, for your kind remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, now this webinar will be guided by our moderator, Bapak Michael Dobby. Before I give the floor to Bapak Michael Dobby, I would like to remind you that you can start submitting your questions from now, during and after the presentation by using the Q&A feature. We would also like to remind you to stay with us until the end of the event to get the information you need regarding the e-certificates and also the soft copy of the presentation from the speakers. Now, please welcome our moderator, Bapak Michael Dobby. To Bapak Michael Dobby, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Rifa, for your very clear introduction. Um, and I, I have a great honor today to introduce our speaker for this second webinar of 2022 organized by the Indonesian chapter of the IGS. Um, before I do that, I just also like to give my thanks to the organizers of these events. As, as I always like to mention, they, they do a lot of hard work behind the scenes to make these events successful. And of course, to the attendees, to everybody who, who, who logs in or tunes in or comes in on, on YouTube to listen to these events, uh, thank you also for your time in attending because, because these events are of course being created to help spread knowledge uh, about geosynthetics as mentioned by David just now. And, and um, uh, I hope that you will get everything possible out of this. So today our, our speaker, speaker is, is uh, Errol Tutumluer. Um, we, we just had a quick uh, check on being able to pronounce his family name correctly and, and I'm doing my best, but um, uh, the important thing is we will refer to him as Errol because uh, this is a very nice name and how we would normally do it here. Um, one thing to mention to you is that Errol has never yet been to Indonesia. So his, his first trip here is unfortunately a virtual trip. Um, maybe at some stage in the future we can actually welcome you properly, Errol, uh, to this country because uh, it's a very, very interesting place to, to visit if you've never been here. You've already heard quite clearly about the, uh, the topic of today's webinar. It's to do with railway ballast and essentially um, minimizing degradation of railway ballast by the use of, of geogrids. Uh, obviously, you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, when Errol starts to speak. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning that in, in all of our webinars so far, they have been mostly aimed at structures. So we, we now have another webinar, though, that is more aimed at what I'd call the the horizontal or pavement type of application, uh, rather than looking at walls and slopes, which we've mainly looked at in the past. So this is of great interest. I think you might remember also last year that um, Professor Jorge Zornberg also talked about this kind of application, but this was more to do with the construction of, of road pavements over expansive soils. So this is in that category of, of application of geosynthetics, which is, is a very important one, um, and uh, I said, you'll, you'll hear a lot more about it today. So Errol, Errol is professor at Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I'd have to say, I've actually been there. In fact, with, with, with Sandra, my wife, we went there a few years ago. It's a, a very lovely campus. It's, it's situated uh, uh, quite a long way south of Chicago, um, but a very nice big open campus, and, and it was a great pleasure to make a visit there. I'm so, sadly, didn't, I didn't meet Errol there on that visit, uh, and that came later. Um, but you will see from his um, uh, CV and experience that er Errol is, is very active in, in his field, and he's uh, delivering a lot of lectures, as well as carrying out a lot of uh, extensive research into pavement materials, in particular granular pavement materials. Now, uh, in, in contacting us um, over the last few days, 
Errol also sent us a link to uh, a lecture he presented just last week at the ASCE Geo Congress, which was on pavement materials. And it was what is called the Carl Monismith lecture. And, and uh, uh, I, I listened to it. It's a very interesting lecture. And I think what you will see from, if you listen to that and also from today, is that Errol is trying to provide a much better and fundamental understanding of, of how granular materials work if you like, and, and how we can model them better. If you like to move away from purely um, uh, you know, simple in, 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 in empirical methods and move much more towards a more fundamental understanding. And, and the kind of work that uh, Errol has been involved with is, is very much in that direction. If anybody would like to get the link from that lecture, we can certainly uh, post it to you or let you have it. Um, now, amongst many of uh, er Errol's uh, contributions to, to our engineering um, uh, activities. He is a, an IGS council member, and in fact, he's the, the chair of the publication committee, so directly involved in, in our IGS activities. He's also the, the chair of the ISSMGE TC202 uh, committee on uh, transportation geotechnics. Well, I think I must stop talking and, and uh, allow Errol to, to deliver his webinar. But just to let you know, I, I, I met Errol uh, at the 11th International uh, Conference on Geosynthetics, which was in Seoul, where we actually we, we, we got together, together with two, two very well-known names of J.P. Giroux and Jihan to deliver a workshop on geosynthetics in pavements. And that's how I got to, to first meet and get to know Errol. And, and that was an incredible experience. And... Um, uh, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to listening again to, to some of the uh, information and, and, and work you've been carrying out, Errol, on in this particular area. Railway ballast, yes, it's um, a very interesting area, and, and it's an area where geosynthetics have a great deal to offer. So I think that's all. I, I've taken up enough time, Errol, and I, I will hand over to you, and I'm looking very much forward to this lecture. And now the, uh, the floor is yours. And... Please, everybody, attention now for Railway Ballast. Thank you, Errol. Thank you, Mike, uh, for this very nice introduction. Indeed, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and thanks to uh, David and thanks to the Indonesian uh, Geosynthetic uh, IGS organization, the INA IGS, I believe. Uh, for this nice invitation. Again, uh, this is my first time virtually in Indonesia, but hopefully it won't be my last time and hopefully in person I will come and visit. So uh, with that, uh, let me share my screen quickly uh, with my presentation here. All right. Uh, just to confirm you're seeing my screen, correct? Yes, they're all clear. Yep, we see it. Excellent. And now the slide view here, presentation view. Correct. Also Excellent. perfect, yeah. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, once again, uh, I, 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 this is my, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here uh, actually in front of you today to talk about some of the work we've done on, on ballast stabilization and mitigation of ballast degradation using geogrids. I've been working on geogrids for almost two decades now and uh, some of that recently got applied, especially in the last decade, to railroad ballast stabilization, and that's what I will talk about mostly. But uh, my, as, as, as Mike very nicely covered my background on unbound aggregates, uh, which is primarily what I work on as, the, as a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so I'm, I'm directly affiliated and involved with actually activities of Illinois Center for Transportation, more on the uh, payment side, both for highways as well as uh, airport payments. And then we have another center called Railtech, uh, also established at U of I or University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, I'm, I'm involved with them working on the railroad side. So aggregates are building blocks in every kind of infrastructure, uh, materials and, and layers that we construct. And of, of course, unbound aggregate layers being one of them. So with that, uh, this, this presentation, again, is uh, very much on railroads. And let me start by saying a few words about railroads and some background on the railway 
uh, track structure, uh, which is where we will come in now with the geosynthetics need. Again, uh, especially freight railways are very dominant in the United States and rail is the principal means of economically moving large and heavy freight uh, long distances over, over land. And US has huge lands and you can clearly see uh, like a unit train here as a coal train, you, you can tell with the open uh, rail cars actually and the coal dust in the air as you see hundreds of cars carrying carrying coal in this case uh, from uh, from the central United States to some of the uh, uh, plants, uh, basically uh, for burning coal and coal burning plants, right? This is uh, one way that unit trains are often as, as freight as number one rail is used. Rail is also used for other types of freight such as intermodal uh, containers, uh, such as other things and diesel the locomotives are usually the most commonly used in the United States. But uh, again, just to emphasize here that uh, rail transportation combines the speed and energy efficiency in, in such a way that nowadays we talk about sustainable um, transportation uh, efforts. Uh, one ton of freight can be transported 500 miles with just one gallon of fuel. This is hard to beat with any kind of any other transportation mode when you think about that. Of course, uh, being, uh, you know, in addition to those advantages, uh, I will talk about some other things now, how to build infrastructure related to this freight uh, railroad and, and freight railroad often uh, jointly used by passenger lines. And I will get into that as well. Uh, here's a map of North America that shows actually United States as well as Canada and the heavy lines that are uh, in different colors. The yellow color is about 15 to 50 million gross tons of freight carried. And then there's the green ones going up to 100 million gross tons, MGT, they usually call it, right? And then you see over 100 million gross tons. This is exactly the coal uh, powder river basin and the coal transportation in Wyoming and other states bringing the coal to some of the uh, uh, energy plants uh, right here in the middle of uh, basically the country, uh, that's exactly where Illinois is, very close to where I live, uh, as Mike mentioned. And uh, he, this picture very nicely shows then those heavily uh, used uh, freight lines in North America, a total of about 140,000 miles of track network. When I looked at Indonesia, uh, I, I found about 4,100 miles, uh, roughly about 35 times probably U.S. has the trackage uh, as for the rail network. Uh, and when I looked at the volume of transported freight in Indonesia, I found the numbers going up to 47 million metric tons or so. Uh, between the US short tons and, and I guess metric tons, the conversion is 1.1 uh, metric ton being a little smaller than uh, the, the US short tons. But uh, nevertheless, interestingly, uh, the, the mileage is about 35 times to the trackage, it's 35 times greater in the case of US. And when I uh, compared here the typical uh, tonnage, actually, or million of millions of freight tons per year, there's about 350 times difference in the way that uh, we carry, I guess, uh, a total of 18 uh, billion, 18.6 billion sh uh, short tons of, of freight in the US. So there is a heavy usage. Probably US is second to in terms of the heaviest. U.S. is second to Australia, I would say, but but most often with Australia on the freight trains and the, how heavy they can get, they're kind of competing, right? And that's exactly what you see here. Often gross rail load is, is what's denoted here, is what we use. Again, this is in pounds, uh, but I have some of the metric tons as well. Typically what happens is that what we call as heavy haul freight transportation lines, like those coal lines or so, uh, we go to really heavier cars, and, and these are individual rail cars going up to 286 kips or 315 kips, uh, and, and that really relates to 35.8, 39 uh, tons. This is what we call heavy axle usually. In metric tons, about axle loads going up to 32 to 35 metric tons. So uh, this, is, this is quite heavy, right? 
But it's not just the end of the story because a lot of these heavy freight uh, that we carry on these uh, lines, which are typically ballasted track, just like in Indonesia, uh, we have also passenger trains using the same trackage. And uh, especially now we're get, trying to get our passenger trains to go faster, nothing like dedicated lines to go very fast over 300 kilometers per hour or so like in China and Asia and many other places in Europe, right? We are maybe approaching something like 240 kilometers per hour in what we call as our heaviest traveled passenger uh, line, the US Northeast Corridor, all the way from Washington DC to Boston, about 440 miles in, in between typically, but heavily, heavily used by passenger trains again. Uh, we call it a higher speed with the 240 being the maximum in kilometers, but the challenge is in the same, right in the same trackage, right? How can we actually maintain the ballasted track? And this is often the ballasted track that you see with both the passenger trains and those heavy freight trains. Again, freight trains are very heavy. Passenger trains are much less heavy or, or they're, they're probably uh, about half or less in terms of how uh, you know their their tonnages are, how their uh, axle loads are, but in general they're much faster, right? And there is the issue of safety concerns, especially when both are are, be, are being used on the same trackage and uh, the shared track and the shared right of way. So just like Indonesia, I mean in the U.S., pretty much all of our lines, the trackage over 90 percent, maybe 95 percent, easily owned by uh, freight rail companies, right? So from that perspective, often Amtrak trains are passenger trains have to share those lines with the actual uh, freight lines. So how to get things working on a ballasted track, uh, which consists of a track structure that's seen here, often we call the uh, you know, superstructure uh, right here, uh, sleepers or cross ties we call them, or simply ties in the US, right, and the rails on top, as well as uh, below the cross ties or sleepers, what you have is the ballast, the sub ballast, and, and then the prepared sub grade. So uh, again, and when you think about the ballasted track, it's a bunch of aggregates, just rocks that are supposed to carry the load. Of course, they do other things. And if you just quickly visit what their functions are, uh, when you look at a typical uh, track structure, and the substructure, especially if you're interested for carrying the load, load that's transmitted down below the tie. Ties are often concrete ties and heavy lines, heavy axle load lines, uh, you're right? But, but often you will find in the older lines or more commonly wood ties, uh, they're, they're actually uh, distributing uh, the load. Well, first of all, the ballast, the rocks are, are resisting the track forces. That is, they're providing a track bed basically for the combined uh, cross ties or sleepers and, and rail, which are connected with the fastening system. Uh, so often the lateral stability, longitudinal stability, all of those are, are important to keep the trains traveling on that rail in, 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 in the track, in, 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 in that bed of ballast, so resisting track forces providing resiliency, almost like a bed of uh, the seabed kind of, right? Uh, the ballast is supposed to take all the load and provide the tolerance and resiliency. With that, provide void storage, right? And often uh, ballast starts to degrade and we'll talk about that. That's how the bottom part is kind of filled, right? There's more voids maybe towards the upper part of the ballast. And, uh, but we can actually adjust things and especially geometry corrections. That's how they facilitate, ballast facilitates uh, maintenance. The biggest thing about ballast is that it's uniform size rocks. So it's supposed to actually take time to fill all these voids. And in, in, the, in between, that's what we call degradation or fouling often. It's supposed to provide proper drainage in addition to, of course, uh, carrying the load and distributing the load and the stresses and it's just to make sure that the subgrade actually is not getting those high V load stresses. 
What about the sub ballast right underneath? Sub ballast, uh, in especially new lines, it's it's a very common practice, typically constructed a lot in the U.S. Uh, they're supposed to take also the load and reduce further the stress so that they protect the subgrade underneath the prepared uh, subgrade soil. That is right. Uh, sometimes it's called formation. Uh, it, it's supposed to provide a layer as sub ballast, almost like a pea gravel size in this case, uh, as opposed to ballast is much larger, right? About 50 to 75 millimeter size particles. But sub ballast is supposed to provide kind of a layer in between, again, the subgrade soil and, and the ballast uh, and protecting from frost damage, you know, providing frost protection, providing a separation layer between ballast and subgrade such that there's some filtration going on, right? So filtration meaning that some separation subgrade is not supposed to pump in a uh, typical uh, mud spot or, or uh, typical spot that you will see the, the track getting wet. Uh, we should have the sub ballast prevent that kind of uh, subgrade soil pumping into the ballast layer. It's supposed to also shed water away from subgrade and serve all these purposes as an intermediate layer. So it's supposed to also provide somewhat drainage, but hopefully you can do a better job with some geotextiles and geosynthetics used from that perspective as well. And, and that's also something uh, effectively used as part of sub ballast. I'll talk more about, uh, again, ballast stabilization though with the geogrids especially using geogrids. I will get to that uh, in a few minutes. So uh, understanding the heavier loads, as the loads get heavier, what happens? Uh, often when you look at the implication of uh, trains getting heavier and heavier because you want to carry more with one pass and so many rail cars or so many cars being pulled by a locomotive, right? Often 20, 30% increase in the load you will say that, oh, that's not a problem. You know, slowly we're increasing in uh, the typical uh, tonnages and the weights of the gross rail loads of the cars and things. But actually it's implication, it's effect on the subgrade from a settlement perspective is, is not that linear. Usually you double, triple sometimes even for a 20, 30% increase in the load level. So that's why it's very important for us, uh, which actually tells us here that we need to understand uh, how to design the thicknesses of ballast just to protect the subgrade, right? Because you don't want to uh, overstress that. That's that's the primary cause of, cause of uh, settlement and, and primary cause of some of the vertical deflections that you will you will see. So uh, this granular layer thickness design came out with some uh, uh, really pioneering work from uh, Professor Silik, uh, very well-known authority in this area in, in ballast and, and ballasted track. Uh, Professor Silik from University of Ma Massachusetts and his students, uh, now deceased, uh, but his students are very active in the railway community. That's how they came up with the thickness of the ballast and sub ballast should be anywhere from for ballast nine to 15 inches. Again, one inch is about 2.5 centimeters, right? You can multiply and then sub ballast three to six inches. So I go switch between the units in my presentation, don't have a chance to adjust them all for metric. But uh, that should give you an idea how thick we want. And I will talk more about that. What are some you know, conditions we determine those thicknesses and how, how we come up with those thicknesses? Again, by understanding uh, how failures may occur due to that weakest subgrade layer and how we need to limit the stress going on top of that subgrade to prevent progressive shear failure or excessive plastic deformation conditions. And I will, I will show you what those are actually, those two especially, what a progressive shear failure often encountered is, especially with channelized traffic in the railroad case. And the second one is the excessive uh, plastic deformation, again, directly under the wheels. So just to give you those, two failure criteria here. Uh, here you see a typical baluster track with the clay subgrade. Often what happens is with the extensive loading, repeated loading always coming from the rail down, you see that bearing capacity failure, the shearing effect, right? And that progressively causes more and more shearing like that and 
and some pockets opening up here more ballast then moves into in that direction as the shearing takes place and that's what's called progressive shear failure now related to this or could be related to directly consolidation and and further deformation under wheel loading the second criterion for failure also has a similar picture where you see those uh pockets that are opening up directly due to some of that shearing right those pockets i call because see there is a depression zone that's the typical surface of the subgrade but that's because of the settlement and the partial shearing that took place right and often that's where the the ballast is migrating and going down and often these pockets hold water they're also called water pockets so to speak because trap water is there so that's the mechanism of how failures in the track substructure especially in the subgrade takes place and you end up losing a lot of ballast into those and you keep replacing bringing new ballast but sometimes losing in, into those mud spots how can we prevent some of that there is there is uh, one uh, application of geosynthetics here in the railroad subgrade stabilization uh, when i say subgrade stabilization again that sub soft subgrade which has become even softer maybe in time because of the water pockets formed under the rails. And by placing a geosynthetic directly below that sub ballast layer, you see now you actually provide a shear layer, a stiff layer that's actually holding very well on top of the soft subgrade and doesn't allow that, that progressive shear to take place and actually improving because it cuts the shear um, bearing capacity slip line, right? it improves the bearing capacity like that. So that's one uh, way that geosynthetics when placed under sub ballast will improve uh, basically load taking ability bearing capacity. Now, interestingly, uh, when you think about how, what percent of most of uh, track substructure maintenance or track structure maintenance is actually spent on uh, really rebuilding the subgrade and, and the sub sub ballast and the ballast when you think about all of those i read about six years ago exactly this time i attended the railroad research review and colin basie the principal investigator working on this project had this pie chart i think this was very relevant because 2.4 billion dollars in the u.s spend uh, as, as noted by the uh, research arm of the uh, association of american railroads ttci here Transportation Technology Center, they, they, they indicate that a majority of that goes into rail repair and maintenance. But then actually, I shouldn't say majority because majority is really in the track substructure, right? Because both the blue and the red ones here in the pie chart relate to really substructure related to subgrade issues, but probably the biggest uh, component in this pie, biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, amount 39.7% goes to really the ballast renewal and all the money spent on ballast for maintenance. Think about those subgrade and, and ballast. That's much larger than even just the rail, which is one of the most expensive components, right? Even, even the rail. So this very much relates to what I did back in 2005 when I started a lot of my uh, railroad research work related to track substructure. Again, as part of uh, you know, uh, the AAR's uh, uh, technology scanning program, I started with understanding the problems of uh, railroad industry in the US. We have uh, basically in US four major railroad companies like class one railroads, and then there are two more of those in, North, in, in Canada but those are all called North American class one railroads. When I asked what their substructure problems uh, were in, typically, uh, I mean, how would they rate as most common, right? The, the companies listed on the top, they came up with some subgrade issues being important, like this is number one as the highest priority, and then drainage problems related to subgrade. But then if you look at this, in this row here where it says ballast problems two companies highlighted as number one and three companies highlighted for priority as number two so ballast indeed 
sits here as one of the most important, just like you saw in that pie chart. This was, this was quite interesting because there's very good correlation. Uh, just to continue on Colin Basie's uh, report from 2016, you can see that he basically listed those as soft subgrade issues and ballast degradation issues. And related to ballast degradation, how it can be maximized ballast life uh, and, and you know improve the poor drainage conditions and things. So uh, actually things really come together, very relevant. And indeed, uh, it, because my second question in the 2005 survey to railroad companies was that uh, out of many of the different sites, observed site problems, uh, if, if there is a result of ballast, uh, you know, what, what kind of issues that you saw that you could attribute directly to ballast, right? And uh, what they pointed out at that time was the poor drainage, <laughs> very common thing that every railroader will recognize the mud spots and the ponding and, and pumping and all those issues, right? And then there's alignment deviations. Again, very relevant that poor drainage associated with fouled ballast, degraded ballast as well. What that means is, okay, when ballast is new, these are just large rocks, single size rocks, typically 50 to 75 millimeter size rocks, right? Uh, but as more trains pass on that railroad track uh, due to attrition, due to actually contact, you know, point to point, basically stone and stone contact, you get chipping and breaking and, and dusting, all of that, it, even if it's not coming from the subgrade, it's the ballast particle itself get churned and get, get, gets broken down basically. And that's how you end up with typically filed ballast. Uh, these are some calibration balls because we do a lot of imaging related work in this recognition of this degradation and quantification actually by doing some segmentation recently. That's the reason, but typically how we quantify that is using sieve analysis. You take a sample from the field, take it in the lab, run your sieve shaking, come up with gradation. And according to Professor Selig and as reported in his book in 1994 with Waters, you can clearly see fouling index is the summation of passing the number four and number 200 sieve sizes. So usually starts from zero, zero is clean or one or zero, right? Clean new ballast goes up to 40. Similar thing is the second index that he defined, which is just percentage of material below the nine and a half millimeter size or three eighths, we call it as inches. And that's also a similar scale, two to 34, you see. Uh, so that's, that's how in practice uh, companies really evaluate the ballast condition, whether or not it is highly filed, heavily filed to be replaced or not. Well, if you don't replace or do some maintenance when ballast gets degraded like this, this is, this is, these are some end results. This is what can happen, right? You can clearly see the uh, ponding, the poor drainage, all the water accumulation and pumping. Pumping with uh, all the mud that's surrounding all the ties that you see or, or sleepers. Now the question is, can geosynthetics improve this load bearing and stability for us? Or can geosynthetics also help us to minimize these maintenance cycles of typically the first maintenance they do is to open up the drainage channels on the shoulder. Shoulder ballast cleaners are used. That's exactly one of those in action that you see on the left side photo. And the right side photo is there's a very heavily fouled ballast now and they're completely replacing the whole ballast by lifting the track and, and basically the ties all together and undercutting basically and uh, putting new clean ballast, right? But can we actually extend these maintenance cycles by maybe eliminating a lot of movement and degradation taking place in ballast with the help of geosynthetics? Uh, my answer to you, yes, we can do that. And that's, that's, where we, that's where we come into the second place where we can use geosynthetics in the railroad track structure, which is right in the ballast. Instead of underneath the sub ballast, that was the soft subgrade remediation option or stabilization. Here, the second one I'm talking to you about is just 
uh, basically immobilizing ballast particles and, and uh, minimizing their degradation and breakage and degradation by actually placing a geogrid, especially very effective, right? Geogrids holding these rocks in place. That application requires to put a geogrid below the ballast layer right here, you see. Uh, so that geosynthetic is often a, a grid, which we will talk about. The grids just, just like, they look just like this, right? Typically, uh, we have all kinds of different aperture sizes and shapes these days. Sizes and shapes have to be picked, matched with the typical rock gradation sizes and shapes. And uh, typically, you just lift the trackage, and underneath that, you just place your geosynthetic geogrid more effectively. But make sure that, again, those rocks will match with some of the aperture sizes. These are some photos from Europe applications, actually, uh, in Europe. We have more that I will show you coming up. But before I show you some really great examples of how this works, let's identify the right mechanism. And this is now uh, agreed upon among all researchers in this field that the identified mechanism in, in these aggregates, unbound aggregate layers, including ballast, lateral restraint is the way to stabilize that. That is immobilizing individual particles moving laterally under the vertically applied wheel loading, right? That will uh, really um, minimize the abrasion and the breakage of these rocks and therefore extend their, their service lives. With that, it's not just more immobilizing, helping the cause of minimizing degradation, but also when you place a geogrid, for example, towards the bottom of that ballast layer, right? Uh, make sure that you place actually geogrid below the reach of the tines. Tines are temping tines, right? Often. Uh, ballast is tempted with those to, to put into some geometry correction, uh, the track, uh, you want to really put them far away from the reach of tines and, and actually towards the bottom where there's the most movement observed is, is the best for capturing those rocks from lateral movement or minimizing their lateral displacements. By doing that, actually, we stiffen, we form a shear layer, which is stiffening the layer underneath. That helps to improve also bearing capacity too, and that helps really uh, extending the life of, of ballast. So we call that stiffening because it's observed, and I will show you we're measuring now stiffness increases realized by geogrid stabilization, mechanical stabilization as well. So decreasing the time-dependent settlement will actually help us with providing an increased modulus of ballast at the time of construction, but at the same time, that increased modulus will be kept, that stiffness will be kept uh, to carry load better, right? By minimizing degradation potential of the ballast, therefore the decrease of modulus in time with the ballast getting older will be minimized if you have a geogrid stabilizing the ballast layer. So that extends again the ballast life and reduce maintenance cycles. So it's a very sustainable application. Uh, how to match the best, the openings of, or the apertures of these uh, geogrids with the rock sizes, right? Ballast sizes. So this is the Holy Grail and there's there's been a lot of research going on on this. Uh, my personal uh, research favorite and interest over the years. And uh, I'd like to show you this picture because it's, a, it's from a colleague, uh, Professor Mulabdic from Croatia. I came across with him and met with him in several of these European Geogrid Expert Panel meetings. This is his picture, but I think it captures everything. Uh, in addition to a sheer friction with actually capturing rocks in those apertures, you're providing a very well interlocked system, completely immobilizes rocks, and that interlocked system, geogrid and aggregate interlock, is actually maximizing right there both the stiffness and, and actually maximizes it as impact and effect. So what's the right size of the aperture to D50 uh, average size of, median size of the material, right? According to Professor Mulaptic, that's about two to three times 
S over D50 in this case. But you will see that this changes whether you have a dense graded uh, material like an Amban aggregate base course, or most often for ballast layers, these are one size. Now I'll, I'll bring to you actually the findings of others. What we're trying to do once again is directly below where the load is applied in the railroad track, you want to minimize this lateral movement of the ballast rocks. And by providing a geogrid like that, you can actually capture and you can actually make them you know, not move laterally, right? That naturally makes that close to the geogrid location, a much higher increased stiffness layer that we call uh, is, is the effect, mechanical stabilization effect. And that effect is getting less and less as you go away from where the geogrid is placed, right? That's the mechanically stabilized unbound aggregate layer concept, which applies to ballast in this case as well. It helps to provide uniform support, control permanent deformation in the long term, uh, and, and certainly uh, works with the mechanism of the lateral restraint. Now, early work on this in trying to understand what uh, aggregate size would match with actually geogrid apertures, right? Uh, some of the early work goes back to Nottingham University in UK, uh, 2006 tests, original tests that Professor Steve Brown started with. And uh, in either a single actuator or a series of actuators like that representing typical uh, you know, load coming down from individual sleepers or, or, or cross ties, and how to minimize under repeated loading, simulating a train passage, right? And the wheels and the bogies of the train, um, so many cycles of those, how actually you can minimize the settlement and deformation in a test setup like this by the use of geogrids. And indeed, if you look at the picture that they have obtained, for a certain target settlement, because if you have too much settlement, that's going to end of, that's going to end the life of that layer four, your track structure for you, right? So maybe you're targeting a certain threshold settlement value. In that case, you can clearly see without geogrid, this control and with geogrid, there's a huge, huge number of load cycles additional that you can do with, with geogrid, right? Uh, this is something often we refer to as traffic benefit ratio. So much more traffic you can put on now for the same amount of settlement. Another way to look at it can be, uh, you know, this is an example, a typical design chart from the network rail in UK. Again, uh, typical existing lines, this, this gives you, depending on under a sleeper, what's the support stiffness, dynamic sleeper support stiffness K, right? Depending on that value, uh, you know, these are the different values, a higher values required for a higher speed train, right? Very little tolerance. But let's say the green one is the typical main line. Uh, you can actually reduce the thickness of the total track bed by using a geogrid as opposed to no geogrid, the green line, right? You can clearly see that you can also benefit by actually reducing the thickness of the granular layer by the placement or in inclusion of a geogrid. So that's another way to take advantage in the benefit or realize the benefit of this. Indeed, uh, and this is another example from UK, the main Western uh, coastline here in this case. And uh, this is from Phil Sharp uh, now with ACOM, very nice uh, application here. Uh, everything was changed except for the rails, new ballast, new sleeper, uh, and, and using geogrids now at the bottom of the ballast layer for ballast uh, stabilization case, they were able to actually really cure, or, or I would say uh, really fix the issue of a recurring settlement every other year or every two to three years. This is exactly that curve that shows you a typical uh, accumulation rate of 1.43 millimeter per year, right? And in a matter of few years now, you're accumulating more settlement. By actually adding the geogrid in this timeline here, they were able to see, get a much lower rate of accumulation of deformation. So that tells you that the, the recurring problem over the years 
they solve by the use of GeoGrid very effectively. Another very effective example, this is one of the very few that you will find actually in bridge approaches as a transition zone, we call it often uh, in, in traffic applications, right? Whether highway or, or railroad, uh, this is the bump at the end of the bridge issue, very common issue. Uh, sometimes a, 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 an approach slab, like a tapered concrete slab, as they denote here, a show, uh, is, is something people like to try, but often that doesn't solve the problem, that just extends the location of the pump. The bump now also moves ahead and still at the end of that rigid extension. So, but to smoothing that transition, is something they done very effectively here uh, by many layers of geogrid placement. These dashed lines are several layers of geogrid. They were able to really get that uh, zone, uh, the, that's the transition zone, uh, go from a very smooth pile slab into that transition zone and, and the bump didn't come back. So basically they got rid of the uh, bump at the end of the bridge issue by smoothly transitioning with geogrids. Uh, very interesting. Finally, this is one of the most interesting of all. Uh, this is a study that was supported by, I think, the uh, National Science Foundation, EPSCOR, I believe it's called, in, in UK with Professor Steve Brown. Uh, this is very interesting because Professor Brown, in this case, went to a, a geosynthetic geogrid manufacturer and asked them to actually come up with different aperture size grids manufactured for typically the constant size of ballast often used. In this case, it's a typical 50 millimeter size of ballast, as you see new ballast in this test setup. And different size, different basically square aperture grids were manufactured just to see which size will fit with the most typical ballast used in most of ballast to track lines in the UK, right? And they were looking at under the actuator, then the settlement amounts in time with no many load cycles and applications. And if you consider now the settlement is, is accumulating with number of load cycles, they even went ahead to use a steel grid, but also the polymeric geogrids, right? With square apertures and the 65 number stands for 65 millimeter for the square opening, but they tried 32, 38, 50 and right at the 30,000 cycles, the settlement demand is what is shown in this right hand side plot. And you can see that actually minimizing the settlement at that 30,000 cycle was achieved with the 65 millimeter aperture opening. So 65 millimeter aperture to 50 millimeter size of the ballast. So there is a 1.3 ratio, right? Uh, that was very interesting to find. And eventually we did discrete element modeling of this experiment. We got the same thing. I will show you that later on in our research. Uh, one other interesting aspect, I became part of this as well. And I went to uh, Hungary, to Europe, to the university where they used a multi-level shear box test. Uh, an interesting concept again, which is uh, a, a very relevant thing too. Wherever you place a geogrid in a ballast layer, at different levels above, basically you do a shear box horizontal shearing to understand at what level, that's why it's multi-level, right? At what, what level the force will be maximized and you know uh, how, how this effect of the geogrid can be seen with or without geogrid in a shear box experiment. Uh, this is a quite large setup actually in box uh, and uh, well, typically, uh, very good, that means you have no end effects and it's kind of realistic. And these are results. If geogrid is here at this level where the x-axis is in this plot, right? Uh, where is gonna be the shearing plane exactly here or just a little above, about 10 centimeters above, about 20 centimeters above. So these are the data points that actually were obtained uh, for force values to plot these charts. Uh, in a compacted ballast layer, you always have a peak like that, whereas the other non-compacted lose ballast. And always the red line in this case, you see in both cases, compacted and uncompacted, red case is with geogrid. The, the one 
with the blue color is no geogrid. So you can clearly see the improvement in the shear uh, taking ability of the material above, above the geogrid much, much higher. Now, how did geogrid come into US practice in the use? Uh, some of my colleagues uh, and one of my students actually who was working on this uh, quite hard with the American Railway and Railway Engineering and Maintenance uh, Association, Main Maintenance of Way Association, ARIMA. Uh, they were finally able to get uh, ARIMA in 2008 to accept to use geosynthetics and especially providing geogrid for, for uh, stabilizing ballast and sub-ballast layers. And uh, the picture that you see here is uh, one of our professors at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign from 1920s. The time of the railroad boom when Professor Arthur Talbot came up with all the aggregate gradations. He did pioneering work in concrete and aggregate optimum gradations as well as uh, like dense graded, right? As well as railroad at that time. The, the thickness design of the ballast comes from basically his work that we always use. That's how we determine some of the thicknesses, uh, minimum 12 inches or so we need below a concrete uh, sleeper or tie usually. Uh, things like those come from basically uh, protecting the subgrade or sub ballast as well as what is the pressure at the bottom of the uh, tie. That gives us that H thickness equation, right? But nevertheless, that, that picture, that slide tells you that now we have in the ARIMA spec, our railroad spec, uh, use of geogrid. And with that, uh, they were able to go ahead and use in some of the applications, like the Utah light rail project in this case, uh, by putting a geogrid below a sub ballast, kind of the subgrade stabilization application, remember, they were able to go from a 12 inch to eight inch thickness in the case of sub ballast, which is quite, quite useful to have that. And another application where they looked at the differences in uh, triangular aperture versus rectangular aperture geogrids. Uh, in this case, in Wilsonville, Alabama, these were staging tracks, uh, 10 inches of ballast and about eight inches of sub ballast underneath. Uh, the experiment had considerations for instrumenting actually railroad track to understand uh, how deformations take place from just visual observations, just like looking at some of those points on top of the uh, ties as well as they placed pressure cells at the bottom to understand uh, subgrade pressures, what subgrade pressures were measured, right? Here is your total station and that's how they're observing the top of rail or top of tie displacements. Uh, but from the pressure cells, what they observed, very interestingly, uh, what pressure levels go on top of the subgrade. And in the case of uh, biaxial or triaxial or, uh, you know, the again, rectangular or triangular aperture grids, how different they, they perform and, and triangular happen to have actually a little better uh, bridging effect and uh, stiffer maybe layer to cut down the pressure even further, right? That's, that's a good thing to see. One other aspect is also another experiment research project uh, tried uh, with, a, with a smart rock concept that was developed by one of my PhD students. Now a professor at Penn State, uh, Professor Hai Huang, developed this smart rock idea. The outside shell is basically 3D printed and inside there is, uh, there is there's a uh, multitude of sensors basically uh, from uh, all triaxial three-dimensional accelerometers, gyroscopes, um, you know, as well as pressure and temperature sensors, right? So when you place this in a setup like that and you're doing cyclic loading, actuator loading tests, and now without geogrid and with geogrid, you want to observe the movements of this rock, which all has the instruments near a geogrid or in the no geogrid case, they were able to see the typical particle accelerations in three directions, right? X, Y, Z directions. And with geogrid, the same location, see how particle accelerations and vibrations minimized. What's really interesting is that actually particle rotations were recorded much higher in the without geogrid case, and they drastically were decreased to nothing, no rotation at all in the case of with geogrid. 
So uh, this kind of a smart sensing technology can help us really detect and show clearly the effects of immobilizing and, and holding uh, you know, rocks in place by the geogrid, which is effectively what it does. Uh, another field application from TTCI, Association of American Railroads. I was somewhat involved with this uh, field project. Uh, again, some of my colleagues got to work. A recurring problem of wet embankment condition for a railroad track. This is Norfolk Southern side in Ohio. And for about four or five years, they were able to place a geogrid like that and cut down the recurring settlement issues. Then I think in 2017 and 18, when they finally visited the site, they realized there was some embankment movement, like deeper ground movement in this case. But until that point, uh, really ballast stabilization worked with geogrids very effectively. So I will only show a few other slides from my experiments and research uh, at the University of Illinois, because you know we were intimately involved in actually doing a lot of field work uh, and discrete element modeling uh, that uh, for 20 years now, I've been working on this with the, with the ballast settlement and unbound aggregate movements uh, and, and relating those to realistic way of capturing particle shape, angularity, and typical sizes and shapes, realistically creating then uh, individual particles with the typical crushed stone shapes and texture and angularity and everything. That's something we have been doing a lot in, in uh, in, in research at the University of Illinois and relating those to actual problems of ballast fouling and modeling of the ballast layer and discrete element modeling, as well as uh, settlement right here as the bump at the end of the bridge, right? Uh, right here, the transition zone differential settlement issue. So some of these things we have been studying all along. And having said discrete element modeling uh, with the individual particles in contact, this is very much particulate medium. You cannot assume continuum. So you have to go back to a discrete element methodology where contact forces have to be analyzed in a, in a kind of an iterative uh, time iteration based domain where actually uh, equilibrium equations for uh, again, uh, angular as well as static uh, uh, equilibrium conditions are satisfied uh, with time iterations. So that's the basis of discrete element modeling. I will show you some results of that in our analysis. Uh, actually, what we did discrete element modeling on was actually based on a ballast testing specimen in the lab. And this picture shows how ballast samples we tested were actually reinforced or stabilized by the use of uh, geogrids, right? Uh, this goes back to some of the uh, actually interesting discussions we had uh, in, in the 25th year anniversary, or we call it the Jubilee Symposium of Geogrid in, in London when we had a meeting in 2009, where Dr. Giroux had a very nice paper also he presented on what are the things that make this aggregate interlock, geogrid and aggregate interlock, right, to come together? So you can clearly see that, as he also stated, the, the factors that this interlock depends on are aggregates gradation and shape properties, both size and shape, in addition to, of course, geogrid's aperture size and the stiffness of the rib and shape of the rib and the depth of the rib, depth or the width, right? Uh, but as well as the compaction conditions, you also saw that in the multi-level shear box and, and loading conditions. They all have to be evaluated for the proper interlock. Having said that, the second most important thing after size on aggregate particles is the shape. And my almost 30 years of effort since late 1990s, to quantify shape properties, such as the flatness, elongation, angularity, surface texture, by, by quantifiable indices. And for that, we've been using image analysis technologies. This is the Enhanced University of Illinois Aggregate Image Analyzer. It's a second generation one with now color cameras and color thresholding to actually get the uh, top side front views and bring them together to come up with realistic 3D polyhedrons as ballast particles in discrete element modeling, right? Uh, by, by capturing exact properties as indices from an actual rock placed here on a conveyor belt, right? In the view of three orthogonal cameras, 
we are able to come up with a 3D polyhedron shape and put them then into a discrete element model like that, which we call it the one we use in, at the University of Illinois as blocks 3D. And we can actually come up with an actual track, a ballasted track to look at settlement issues, tamping issues with tamping tines, it's, it's consolidation, it's, it's, it's actually lateral stability, all kinds of things we've been studying. So we use that technology to do the modeling, discrete element modeling of a geograde ballast stabilization study of Professor Brown's from 2007. And if you remember, this is the, the uh, curve that we saw in the actual experiment, how the different aperture size of, uh, the aperture size of 65 millimeter square aperture grid actually matched with the 50 millimeter size uh, ballast particles to minimize the displacement, right? Uh, we didn't go all the way to 30,000. This is a very uh, time consuming simulation, but even at the 40 cycles that we could do in this case, at similar void ratios, we were able to capture the same uh, and get the same result of 65 millimeters, very effective, right? These are the kind of things really come together very nicely. Uh, the next thing we did was then a large ballast triaxial test, right? This is 30 centimeter in diameter by 60 centimeter high specimens that allow us to go to two to three inch top size, 75 millimeter top size rocks placed in this. Typically you have uh, aggregate top size to uh, basically uh, actually diameter about five to six ratio. And that's exactly what you can build a ballast specimen here in this kind of a triaxial test. Uh, we can do three different LVDTs, 120 degrees apart for the axial deformation. And then in the middle, we have a circumferential extensometer uh, just to get the bulging also measured from typical tests. And that's what we have been using to actually place geogrids in some geogrid stabilized ballast specimens to understand how ballast works in typical triaxial tests, right? And uh, this is the aluminum mold, that's the split mold, that's how we build in typically four layers, compact uh, each layer. And in the middle you place, for example, um, or like, like you see in these pictures, either a triangular aperture grid or a rectangular aperture grid, right? And we run shear strength test and permanent deformation test. So, here is an example of an actual shear strength test, which is a rapid shear, we call it really very fast, 5% deformation strain rate per second. And you can see the huge bulging and things. So actually we were able to simulate this using discrete element method. Uh, and I'll show you the simulation of that as well. But one thing we always you know, worked around with the actual experiment was that, where should we place a geograd in the specimen for maximizing shear strength or minimizing permanent deformation. So certainly middle is, is where the bulging is taking place, but what about, uh, what if we put two geogrids, would that be more effective? And where would we put the geogrids? Uh, what location, what height in the, in the specimen, right? Uh, so eventually we found out what makes sense is that where the bulging is happening in the middle, putting two geogrids, close to each other, like 250 millimeter from the top, 250 from the bottom. See, that gives you the highest shear strength. That was the case for a rectangular aperture grid, and that was the case for a triangular aperture grid. Uh, the triangular aperture looked similar with one versus two actually, but, but anyways, still uh, that worked out very well as well. Well, the concept is you wanna capture where the bulging is, the, the lateral movement of the rocks and, and geogrids nicely hold that uh, prevent the bulging. So here are the discrete element models created to actually model this, the experiment. And this is a triangular aperture grid in the middle. And then there is a rectangular aperture grid in the middle. And interestingly, the outside where you see those overlapping elements, those are the flexible, those are representing flexible membranes. We just allow those to overlap those blocks because they have to allow the bulging of the specimen too. 
and they're not rigid. They can overlap, but only the outside cell membrane elements as blocks can do that to allow for the bulging. And indeed, that bulging happens as the specimen is going through that. Oops, you see in the middle, they're moving out, allowing the bulging to happen. That's how we simulated that experiment. And you can, you can see what happens in a shear strength test here, uh, how the specimen deforms with 5% strain and 10% strain, the shortening of the length, we could, we could actually model the same thing as you can see. All right, and when we looked at out of those eight different locations of the membrane elements outside the specimen, which ones are moving out the most? And that's what this is showing, uh, right? The ML5 happens to be like in the middle. Again, it, 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 it shows us clearly the bulging happening in the middle in the experiment as well. So in short, in summary, again, uh, you see the highest shear strength is achieved at two geogrids very closely placed right in the middle where the bulging is. If they are far away from each other, they don't do any good, right? They, they may even create some slip failure plane because in the middle part, you, you have the uh, shearing effect of the specimen uh, realized and, and that really doesn't do any good. You need to bring them in the middle where the bulging is prevented. Same thing uh, for cutting permadeformation and shear strength are very much similar. The only difference is in permadeformation testing, now you have cycles to go through, right? And the rest periods in between, just like typical wheel loads repeatedly are applied. And uh, when you realize that with so many load applications, now you're looking at how much deformation, permanent deformation is accumulating in a uh, stabilized specimen in the middle, for example, here with either rectangular or triangular uh, aperture grids. And you can clearly see that permanent deformation is cut down. This is an actual test result, by the way, we also simulated it too, um, but the, the test result gave the same thing. And the one is test result, I think data is, uh, the, kind of they're, they're matching each other. Um, we had both published in 2018, actually. Yeah, so that was, that was, that was quite good. In, in conclusion, from field lab and DEM discrete element modeling studies, uh, clearly we showed that geogrids stiffen and hold the aggregate layer through the interlocking. So in, 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 in order to understand the interlocking and what factors play a role, we use the imaging-based techniques to exactly simulate and characterize the aggregate size and shape. And therefore that's how we studied that stiffened zone and that really helped us to understand the micromechanical interactions between geogrids and, uh, and, and, and aggregates. Yet, there's, there are still questions to ponder, which is, I know I showed you a couple of different experiments. What's the aperture uh, size, the appropriate geograd aperture size and, and degradations? And uh, there's still somewhat differences in researchers' results. And uh, things like, uh, well, Brown came up maybe uh, with some general range, Professor Steve Brown, uh, Glenn McDowell did some more work, came up with some other 1.4 ratio versus 1.2, 1.3. Some others relate back with D50 instead of maximum top size of the specimen, right? So there's still differences in what's the right match. But it's not just the size match. There's also particle shape match and everything, plus the geograd properties and even the depth of the rip, uh, for example, and the junction. Uh, all of those things uh, play a role in this interlock, right? So uh, from that perspective, the end effect of this lateral restraint mechanism is that you're creating a stiffened zone about the geograd, right? That stiffened zone is helping uh, to minimize the permanent deformation in time because it's stiffer and it stays stiff like that. And it, it doesn't allow, again, aggregates to go around to create the mechanically stabilized ballast layer. So what if we could come up with a way to measure stiffness? Measuring stiffness is so difficult, right? But, but are there techniques that we could, we could try? 
And this is the last part of, <laughs> only I have a few slides left here to finish. Last part of my presentation, which is really interesting because again, uh, for about 20 years, I've been questioning how can we understand the stiffening effect? And, uh, you know, a postdoc who started working with me and we started looking at uh, ways to be able to uh, use the shear wave transmission, uh, shear wave generation idea to understand local stiffness quantification. And this is a TRB paper as a result of that using the Bender element shear wave transducers. What Bender elements do actually, these are piezoelectric sheets. And when you have a mounting base like that and you place this mounting base right outside of a specimen, basically through the membrane into the uh, specimen transversely, you just place them. There is a, there is a source uh, or transmitter uh, and then there is a receiver. And with the distance in between now, you're generating a shear wave as the shear wave travels, uh, a certain distance is picked up by the receiver and by dividing the, uh, actually, by, uh, by actually knowing the time that it took, a uh, distance divided by time, you get a shear wave velocity, right? So this piezoelectric sheet right here is doing the fishtail, right? Here it shows us up and down. Uh, that's creating a coupling with the medium. That's creating actually the shear wave and that shear wave transmission helps us to calculate the shear wave velocity, which is linked to a small strain modules. There is an equation to calculate this. So that's exactly what we did. To capture the mechanically stabilized zone above a geograde installed in the middle of a specimen, right? So we, we had three pairs of source receiver sets, basically uh, placed like that. And all you need to do is a signal generator for these, um, sensors, and then uh, pre-post amplifiers with an oscilloscope where you actually control the signal shape. That's how we made this part of our typical Brazilian modules test equipment. Interestingly, uh, on a specimen like this, when you measure the Brazilian modules uh, with, with, from the full length of the specimen or height of the specimen, right? Stabilize or not stabilize. Uh, these are stabilized with square or triangular aperture grids or unstabilized. And for different stress states, these are 15 stress states we usually go through, right? In a typical resilient modulus test, you can clearly see that there's not much difference, really. And you cannot tell because some of the effect of more immobilizing the aggregate by the grid is, is kind of a local phenomenon. But resilient modulus requires obtaining strain, recoverable strain from the full length height of the specimen. So it really doesn't capture the effect of the geogrid. Whereas with the Bender element shear wave generation above a geogrid like that in the middle of the specimen, very interestingly, we were able to get the local stiffening effect quantified. So near the geogrid, you can clearly see that that's the uh, red uh, triangular symbols that says middle, middle of the specimen right here, above the geogrid directly. Much higher shear moduli at the same stress states, 15 stress states captured, compared to the top, top being the, uh, on the top, the pair here shown, which is far away from the geogrid, that's much lower. And, and the one in between is in the middle, <laughs> right there. So you can clearly see the mechanically stabilized zone, the, the concept captured by these horizontally instrumented Bender element sensors pairs. And with that, we, we did run through square grids and triangular grids and different types of grids that also showed us such effect. And we were able to capture, but interestingly in a no geogrid case from those three different locations, three different pairs, they didn't come up with any difference, right? because there's no geogrid to hold the material uh, and lateral restraint uh, you know, mechanism is not applied in the case uh, of no geogrid. That was great. A full application of this to 15 stress states with triangular grid and square grid, you can clearly see a shear modulus ratio that we obtain as we go closer to the grid. Grid is right on the x-axis location. If you think about the triangular grid, 
and a, and a rectangular grid. So this is something I presented actually in Atlanta in a conference, uh, but this is how we capture that mechanically stabilized zone, right? And again, just a simplified version. If the grid is here in the middle of the specimen or at the bottom of the layer as we do in the field, right? If we place some of these sensors, we can capture uh, the shear wave from shear wave measurements, the, the, the small strain modulus properties. And that's exactly what we are doing in this case, placing on a geogrid uh, or a geogrid that is uh, basically digging down in a constructed aggregate layer. This is a, more of a payment a base course layer in this case, uh, just to show you, we, we built with some funding from the Army Corps of Engineers who invested in this technology, sensor technology now, uh, we have actually come up with a frame where we have protected uh, source and receiver sets all in plane, supposed to actually do the about four feet, 120 uh, centimeters apart. That's how we're transmitting in this medium, just directly above the grid. As you see, it's above the grid. And we also place this kind of a vendor element field sensor in other locations, actually three locations in the FAA's test center, test sections here. Uh, the one immediately above the geogrid upon construction gave us the higher shear wave velocity and higher shear modulus as opposed to four inches above and as opposed to in the south section, there was a control without the geogrid placement. So clearly we were able to quantify all this. Uh, last two slides, just to show you the most recent focus, what we are doing in the lab right now, actually, as we speak, uh, we have a box where we actually, we use that as for calibration and one side is usually have a plexiglass we can see through. Uh, this is a box that can actually take a ballast or different aggregate particles like that. And uh, we have a smaller size vendor element sensor with a source and receiver that's about only 30 centimeters apart these are with the large rocks we are coupling the, again, vendor elements and we are able to send a shear wave transmission like that and uh, obtaining some values right from that, as well as uh, a French panda penetrometer we've been using also from the panda uh, to back calculate some of the shear wave velocities according to the stiffness of the medium we, we, we penetrate with the penetrometer, right? And from that, uh, now, at different filing conditions of ballast, we are able to develop a shear wave velocity profile, both from the vendor elements and the panda, uh, which helps us actually to compare the values and, and, and validate some of our vendor element values with the panda equations as well. And uh, with that, we can probably come up with a better way of quantifying the ballast layer stiffness increase over a geogrid in the field as well. I know I, I've taken probably around 70 minutes here uh, instead of 60 minutes, but really I'm at the end and this is my last slide here. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks. Oh, Errol, thank you for, for that incredible presentation. I think um, for, the, for the whole audience listening today, they, they, they can detect the passion you have for this topic. It comes through. <laughs> Um, and uh, actually, it's interesting, I'll make one other slightly personal comment about this, is that research into uh, the, the combination of geogrids and, and ballast goes back more than 35 years. In fact, the, some of the very early work was done by a, one of our earlier speakers from last year, Richard Bathurst. He did some testing, sure. published about 1986, which was very much what we call empirical approach. But now... I think yeah. what we see with the work you're doing is you're trying to really get inside there, trying to get inside and, and to understand far better what's really happening and, and things like the bender element work and, and I mean this very clever smart rock. Right. When I, when I right. first saw smart rock, I thought, wow, that's right. really smart because it's actually telling you what's going on <laughs> inside the, in the ballast or, or the aggregate layer. And I, 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 I thought that was a, a very a relatively inexpensive but very clever piece of work to understand the fundamentals of what's going on so and yeah Errol, you, you illustrated so many great things there we have quite a lot of questions so i i, I mustn't uh, hold up too much some of them are 
quite short and some of them are quite long. So I'll take them from the top because that's the order they've come in. So sure. we have from, if you can see them as well, but uh, from Zoe Lin, uh, are there any software or design guideline for ballast stabilization? Uh, not that I'm familiar with. I know, uh, I know there are some software programs available in general for geogrid stabilization. Uh, one that I'm familiar with, again, uh, is, is more for payments, I believe, payment-based courses uh, and, and sub-bases, uh, but not for ballast, as I understand, as I remember. So... Um, yeah, I think I, I think I agree. I think I agree, Errol. I, I think there is yeah. something for sub ballast, but yeah. not necessarily for ballast. I mean, I can relate to only one company who has a, a good good version, good software for payment base, but uh, but not for <laughs> railroad ballast. Yeah, right. Okay, no, great, no, thanks. So the second question from uh, Raihan Aditya: uh, What standards are used for geogrids to improve subgrade stabilization? So other standards that, that relate to the geogrid use. What standards are used using geogrids to improve subgrid stabilization? Uh, well, subgrid stabilization application usually lends itself to soft subgrade conditions. And uh, most more commonly, I, I, I think uh, in the case of payments, it's more construction platforms and things and CBR, uh, California bearing ratio numbers, again, strength parameter, right? Uh, something below three uh, or four at the most. Uh, and uh, whenever you go into three to eight kind of CBR, that's that's more like um, you have to have a complete pavement or uh, again for railroad, I don't think this is uh, very, very commonly stated or we, we have clear guidelines on that either. So um, yeah. Okay, no, no, thanks. Sir. Okay, actually, I forgot to mention to everybody that um, of course, uh, Errol is speaking to us, I assume, from his home, which means that he's exactly a 12 hour time difference from us. So he's keeping going incredibly well. If you look at the, the time here now, 1130, that means 1130 with Errol as well, but the other 1130. Um, yeah, so, I hope so, I don't look very sleepy. So No, 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 you definitely don't. <laughs> okay, we have a, a long but very interesting question, CK Lee, is uh, it is understood that the geogrids work by providing lateral restraint. However, I suppose we should also consider the strain compatibility of the ballast and the geogrids. I suppose that the lateral stiffness of the ballast and the geogrids are magnitudes apart, i.e. the ballast would have to displace significantly before the mechanism of lateral restraint becomes effective. How then can we conclude that geogrids are effective in a statistically significant sense in providing significant lateral restraint? I understand that much research, sorry, much research work has been done to prove its effectiveness. The mechanism based on conventional engineering sense seems off, unless the lateral restraint stiffness offered by geogrids are larger and not similar in magnitude to compare to the ballast. So it's, it's a very interesting, long question, but I think a lot of what you've been talking about is tucked away inside the answer as well. Right. Uh, what I generally talked about and showed in the, the work, geogrid work that I did, the type of geogrid typically uh, mostly I used was uh, stiff geogrids. These are either extrude, extruded geogrids or punched and drawn geogrids. Um, so uh, unitized kind of, right, from punching and draw, 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 drawing and uh, right. Um, so from that perspective, these are stiff grids I used and, and there's not much of really flexing of the geogrid. But uh, there are other types of welded geogrids. There are other types of geogrids that uh, will come in different mechanisms for capturing uh, the rocks. And uh, this is something actively, we have a study started with our Illinois Department of Transportation here. And we're looking at different types of geogrids uh, exactly with the vendor element sensor now understanding, uh, quantifying stiffness increases and things. And that's an actual study we have initiated uh, uh, and collecting different types of geogrids for evaluating those. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, actually, the, the next question is, is quite closely related, but this is also from Zoe Lin. Uh, most 
stiff geogrids are presented in your presentation, of course. How, how about the performance of flexible geogrid for ballast stabilization? That's, that's exactly my answer I already gave you, which is uh, I'm not that familiar. and I, I haven't uh, done much. Uh, I don't have enough experience on uh, flexible geogrids, but that's something now we're getting more into in that co comprehensive study. Uh, yeah, I'm collecting uh, g all kinds of different types of geogrids, including those flexible geogrids, yeah. Okay, right, thanks. Bro. Now from uh, Claudia Brownich, um, did you perform cyclic tests in the triaxial test? If so, what frequency did you use? Yeah, we did. Uh, indeed, uh, it's, it's not a frequency uh, when you, I mean, truly when you call it a cyclic test, frequency is the way to uh, define what it is. And uh, uh, what we call in vehicle loading, and that, that's how I believe it's supposed to be, is repeated load tests, we call them which means uh, for correctly uh, representing the actual field stress states, even in the case of a train loading, believe me, there's rest periods in between wheel load applications, pulses. So therefore you have to give, uh, the, according to the speed of the train, according to speed of a truck, for example, you have to take into account what's the load pulse duration and what duration of rest you have to give instead of a continuous sine wave, for example, cyclic, right? So that's why it's not the frequency, but we usually talk about uh, commonly 0.1 to 0.4 second load duration and about 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 uh, goes with 0.4 and then 0.9 up to maybe goes with 0.1 second rest periods with them. But, but all of these have to be nicely adjusted according to the typical speeds and, and at that depth, what speeds are felt in terms of actual load pulse and actual rest period, right? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's a big topic. Um, I know in ballast testing, a lot of colleagues, uh, close colleagues actually, they, they just simply run cyclic uh, tests. But in my opinion, cyclic tests give you a harsher picture, uh, a much harsher treatment to ballast than typical vehicle or loading. And uh, what that means is that you apparently uh, get, uh, maybe it's conservative, uh, much worse conditions realized through a cyclic. If you don't give any rest period to the, to the specimen, that means you accumulate much more permanent deformation than realistic, for example. Right. Yeah, interesting point. Yeah, so another one from, this is another from CK Lee. Uh, what stress path in the traxial test are you following? Conventional drain shearing. Is it? conventional drain shearing? Uh, most of our samples are partially uh, saturated and, and that's, uh, you know, typically we have open valves and things, uh, uh, but, you know, never we get to a saturated state. Uh, you, can, you can do that actually with some pore pressure measurement, but often that's a very bad case. Uh, we'd like, we don't want to keep any of these aggregate layers saturated. So uh, it's customary to run them uh, with open drainage valve, and, and it's it's usually very much partially saturated anyway. Uh, yeah, simply like that. Okay, thanks, Harold. Okay, so from, from Slamat Widodo, um, which effective laying down geogrid at the top of the subgrade, which is more, more effective, at the top of the subgrade or within the sub ballast based on your experience uh, in, in increasing bearing capacity? So this is all about location of the geogrid in the layer. Right. Um, more commonly, I think it's the bottom of the ballast, uh, sub-ballast, excuse me, for the subgrade stabilization application. And I think this makes sense from the point of, uh, for any kind of uh, vehicular traffic loading and subgrade improvement that you do, you want to put the geogrid usually on top of that subgrade, especially soft subgrade. And that's where I think it, it becomes the, the, the best, yeah. Okay, now CK Lee again. Uh, on, on the placement of geogrid below the ties, and this may be similar, I haven't read it yet. Um, is it shown in the study you presented that the closer the geogrids, the larger the lateral restraint? I said closest to the base of the tie, I assume. For the practical application of geogrids below ties, the placement of the geogrids seems to be way down below the zone where large ballast deformations are expected. How then do you justify the placement of geogrids 
that are far below the ties? Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's the case because, uh, well, first of all, very shallow in the ballast. If you place the geogrid, you always have an issue with maintenance uh, cycles and the tamping tines and, and all those, right? So that's that's where the practitioners will, will really hate to do that, putting shallow. But from my experience, uh, actually, uh, if, if you want to protect from excessive permanent deformation, maybe it makes sense to bring the geogrid little above, a little higher uh, in a shallow depth or shallower depth. But in, bal in, in ballast application, again, you want to extend it down because you want to put it farther away from the tamping tines. The second thing is that usually at the bottom of the uh, layer, if you think the layer is acting all together, that, that's where usually the most spreading is taking place because the bottom of the layer is where you have horizontal tension of, of course, built uh, from a bending point of view when you think about it. And that's, that's really where effectively you can hold the materials best. I gave you the example of in the triaxial specimen, the bulging in the middle, right? I think from the way of the layered system, and, and the bending scenario, the bottom of the layer is, is where you have the spreading the most or the tendency. And that's where it's cutting that tendency, uh, uh, not allowing the horizontal or lateral movement. Um, so that's how it's working. Yeah. Okay, so next question, we've just got a couple more. And I think then we'll bring this to an end, Errol, and we'll let you get some sleep. So, so John, no, no, Buckley, I, you know, John, John Buckley, actually, is my colleague, and he's he's listening in from Australia. So uh, there we are. We're getting we're getting. Uh, we often do have people listening in from way outside Indonesia. So regarding the aggregate image analyzer, uh, how many separate aggregate image capture runs were required to make the DE model shown in the next slides? Obviously, when you were talking, meaningful and representative of actual behavior. Yeah, actually, what we do is we sample the ballast, and then uh, ballast is usually one size, so that helps us. Although, even though it's one size, you still have some smaller rocks to little larger rocks, so it, it's not that big of a variation. Usually, uh, up to hundred rocks or so when we individually quantify their shapes like that with three cameras and and, and 3D, we get all the properties right. Uh, so we don't have to go more than that. Statistically, I think that's usually enough. Uh, assuming that the same uh, rock is used in the project, like the ballast aggregate right from the same quarry and everything, you would assume that then the, the particle shape properties from that representative sample, we, we analyze uh, again one by one, but up to maybe 100 individual aggregate particles uh, that should capture typical average Angularity index, uh, flatness elongation, uh, you know, basically the largest size, the smallest size, what's the, what's the aspect ratio, right? That's the flat to flat and elongated ratio. And all those, that's how we uh, capture those to create the DEM models of those. I must say, for me, I, when you look at the work you do for that modeling, it's, it's just quite incredible to see how how we've progressed in general, and and uh, no, that that. Thank you for, for illustrating all that. Okay, we have two two questions left from the same person. In fact, this is from Pat Go Chi Leong, who who actually was our speaker last month. Um, he talked about a very different topic about uh, the issue of clay shales in in, in uh, reinforced soil structures. But uh, he has some questions for you on today's topic as well. First one mm -hmm. is, how is the fouling index determined? Yeah, the fouling index is, as I mentioned, uh, it's a simple practical definition. Uh, and and uh, in this country, in the US, that is, uh, practitioners are very much sticking with that. I know uh, there are different indices, like uh, there, is, uh, there is a different one, VCI, I think it's called by Professor Indiradna uh, in Australia, different, you know, indices have been developed, but this is based on just percent passing number four, sieve size, added to percent passing number 200, and that simply captures what's falling index, right? But another one called percentage of falling is just basically percentage of uh, material by weight uh, below nine and a half millimeter, that's passing the nine and a half millimeter sieve size. So um, that's how they usually account for that, yeah. Okay, we have, we have one last question and one last comment. So a, a last question from Pat Go, and this is actually a topic which I think you'll be very 
uh, keen to talk about a little bit was uh, from your research, how high is the effect of interlocking or lateral restraint measured from the geogrid? How many centimeters height? Can it reach 80 centimeters or 100 centimeters? Uh, Errol, you'll <laughs> definitely be interested to answer that question. No, excellent point. And that's that's been something uh, for many years, uh, you know, with uh, with my collaborations with uh, uh, some of the DEM researchers all uh, around the country, all around the world, I should say, like uh, Professor Glenn McDowell, for example, from Nottingham. He did a lot of work with Nick Tom. Uh, you know, they did a lot of DEM work. Um, some of the uh, German researchers who work uh, uh, with, with some very interesting geogrid uh, manufacturers supported research with Itasca. Itasca is the company, uh, US and German, again, uh, with the uh, PFC 3D, the, the, again, some commercial uh, discrete element modeling uh, software. Um, many of them come up with typically four, uh, four inches, well, I should say 10 centimeters or so is is, is where that stiffen zone is, okay? But in our experiments, very interesting things we find now, especially with the Bender element sensor, uh, depends on the compaction that can be extended, the effect of the geogrid, well compacted versus loosely compacted sometimes, and, and uh, how that interlock happens with the different gradation and particle crush versus uncrushed particles, for example. Uh, we, we are seeing there are differences in those influence zones, stiffen zones. So that's the effect of how good your aggregate interlock is and how well compacted, right? They all have an influence on that mechanically stabilized layer concept and the effect of the geogrid, how, how far that extends, basically. But 100 centimeters, 80 centimeters, those are too high. Uh, I mean, that 100 centimeters is a meter. <laughs> so. Uh, we're, we're talking about 10 to 20 centimeters at the most, yeah, so. That's, it's a good topic, and, and, and uh, I think there's no one answer to that question, but no, thank, thanks for it. Okay, well, we have number 12. Number 12 is, is actually what I'd like to say myself from my, my colleague, John Buckley, again. Uh, he says, thanks for a very interesting presentation, Errol, which is exactly what I'd like to say as well, and taking time to answer my questions and many others. And he says, good evening from Australia. And Errol, I'm going to say, Myself, good evening from Indonesia, well, for you anyhow. Um, and, good, good morning uh, to you all. <laughs> I guess in Australia, maybe afternoon already. <laughs> no, that, that, that was a, a really excellent presentation. You, you, you put a lot of really up-to-date information in front of us. Uh, and and uh, I, people will look forward to reviewing what, what uh, from, from the PDF of your slides, I'm quite sure. Um, so it's just my job now to, to, to bring this part of our, our webinar to an end and, and to thank you again. Uh, just to let you know that uh, you're, you're welcome to go off to bed, or if you'd like to hang on, it's just a few minutes for the quiz. You can, you'll be told how to uh, get in there either through your computer or for your mobile phone. It's we're using what's called menti.com. So what I'm going to do now is to hand back to, oh, actually, does number 13 come in? But go in relation to that question, is it applied to MSC walls or is, there only to, is it only to the, so I think is, this is the extent of, the effect of geogrid is it only to is, is it applied to MSC walls or only to the the um, the kind of the ballast or or, or road uh, I, I mean concept aggregate aggregate interlock uh, with geogrid is is a concept uh, for any kind of aggregate layer that is it, this is this is the way you know it's supposed to work right in in general of course in the case of uh, typical pavement or railroad track applications the load is coming. Uh, always, you know, and repeatedly applied from the vertical. Uh, the scenario is different than an MSC wall. Now there's horizontal reinforcement, right, and all that. And and sometimes the uh, biaxial nature of, uh, you know, or, or omniaxial, whatever you call it now, with, with hexagonal or triangular, whatever apertures, uh, arresting the movement of particle in all directions, maybe just linked to one direction only in MSC wall. Right, the uniaxial kind of uh, grids versus right. So, but but I think from that point of uh, the interlock and capturing and immobilizing the rock uh, for any unbound aggregate layer, I think that's what GeoGrid is doing. So, I think that's a, that's a very good uh, last word, Errol. I, I will not ask you to answer any more questions. There aren't any more. That that was a fantastic job you did for us. And one more time, thank you very very much.
and I shall You're hand very back welcome. to... You're thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, it was, a, it was a great pleasure. I'll hand back to our, our MC, Rifa, to take us through the, the rest of the event today. Errol, thanks again. Great, great. Okay, thank once you. again, yeah, once again, thank you, Errol Tutumluer, for your excellent presentation. And thank you also thank you. to Bapak Mike Dobi for guiding the session. Next, I would like to invite all of you for the chance to get the very interesting prize by joining a very short game we have prepared. The first winner will get 150,000 and the second winner will get 100,000 rupiah. To give you a disclaimer before we play, Everyone can join this quiz, but for technical reasons, only those who live inside Indonesia are eligible to get the prize. So you cannot go directly to your browser on your phone or your PC and type menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, menti.com. You have to type the code number shown on your screen right now or also there in the chat box. The code is 7289. 58837. Five, Once again, uh, the code is 72895837. Go to menti.com and put the code 72895837. Then fill in your name and make sure that it is the name you submit in the registration for this webinar. So later, if you win the, the uh, if you win, the committee will easily contact you for the prize. Remember, the prize is very interesting. For two winners, we have 150,000 rupiah. And for the second winner, we have 100,000 rupiah. You will not want to miss this chance. So for those who live inside Indonesia, and also everyone who wants to play this game, go to mente.com, put the code 72895837, and fill in your name. Okay, let's see how many people have joined us. Mm, we... Okay, I'm going to share it to you. So we have 25 people. I will be waiting for more. Go to menti.com and then fill in the code 72895837. I'll be waiting for another minute. So do we have uh, the total of 250,000 rupiah will be given to uh, two winners. The first winner will get 150,000 and the second winner will get 100,000 rupiah. But, this, uh, but, but those who live inside Indonesia are the only one who are eligible to get the prize, but everyone can join. So uh, we have 32 people playing with us. Should I count down now? So uh, 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We're going to play for the first. Uh, so all the questions are prepared by our speakers, Errol Tutumluer, just for your information. Okay, let's go to the first question. Answer fast to get more points. Let's see, which of the following listed below is not a function of railroad, railroad ballast layer? Sorry for that. Uh, the first option, is it provide drainage? Is it to reduce stress to underlying layers? Sec third option, provide void storage and resiliency? Or is it to prevent subgrade attrition? So which of the following listed below is not a function of railroad ballast layer? Is it the first option? Is it the second option? Is it the third option? Or is it the fourth option? You have roughly 10 seconds to answer, but if you answer faster, you will get more points. Five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. Let's see what is the correct answer. The correct answer is the fourth option to prevent subgrade attrition. Let's see who lead the leaderboard for the first question. So for the first question, for the first question, we have Dio Alif Utama, who is the fastest, but we, will, we still have two more questions. So brace yourself. Now let's go to the second question. Answer fast to get more points. Which of the following listed below is not a benefit of geogrid mechanical stabilization of ballast? Is it 
to provide an increased modulus of ballast at the time of construction? Is it the second option, mobilize tension membrane forces in geogrid to improve load carrying? Or the third option, minimize degradation of the modulus of ballast over time? Or is it the last option, extend ballast life, for example, reduce maintenance cycle? So is it the first, is it the second, is it the third, or is it the fourth option? Which of the following listed below is not a benefit of geogrid mechanical stabilization of ballast? You have five, four, three, two, one, time up. So the correct answer is the second option, mobilize tension membrane forces in geogrid to improve load carrying. Okay, let's see who leads for the second question. Oh, I think uh, it's different now, the leader. For the second question, Zulfitrian Syaputra leads uh, the leaderboard. But let's see, for the last question, you still have chances to get the total of 250,000 rupiah. Okay, last question. You can answer fast to get more points. According to Dr. J.P. Giroud, which of the following is not a factor to influence level of stiffening due to geogrid aggregate interlock. Is it aggregate gradation, which is size and shape, form, angularity, and texture properties? Is it the second option, geogrid type and aperture size? Or is it the third option, ultimate tensile strength of geogrid? Or is it the fourth option, field compaction effort? You still have time, but you still have the chance to get the total of 250,000 rupiah. So according to Dr. J.P. Giroud, which of the following is not a factor to influence level of stiffening due to geogrid aggregate interlock? Three, two, one, time's up. Let's see. The correct answer is the third option, ultimate tensile strength of geogrid. Let's see. We will have two winners for today, the first one and also the second one with the most points. So let's see who will win the quiz. All right, congratulations for the first winner is Zulfitrian Syahputra with 2,598 points. You, you will get 150,000 rupiah and also congratulations for the second winner with 2,567 points is Sandy. Later, the committee will contact you for the prize. Everyone, thank you for playing with me, okay? Uh, let me stop share right now. <clears throat> So uh, once again, congratulations for all the winners. The committee will later contact you for the prize details. Next for the upcoming webinar, we would like to invite you to the third in IGS geosynthetic webinar that will, that will be presented in Bahasa Indonesia under the theme study experimental geosel sebagai perkuatan lereng dan perkerasan jalan with Bapak Ardi Arsyad PhD from Hasanuddin University as the speaker. The webinar will be held on April 20, 2022 at 10 a.m. GMT plus 7 or Jakarta time. So you can re register by visiting the link bit.ly slash INA IGS APR to 2022 or also shown on your chat box. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of the event. Before you leave this webinar, we would like to inform you that you can access your e-certificates and the soft copy material from the speaker by visiting the link bit.ly slash info in IGS Mar 2022. After filling out the quick survey, you will be redirected to the e-certificate. So you can uh, type the link shown on your screen or also there on your chat box but uh, to note that uh, the the speaker slide will be later distributed um, after the event so once again thank you for your participation we have we hope we can see you at the next event next month finally good afternoon and stay healthy everyone see you